All right, today I want to talk about a class of 35 millimeter cameras, which doesn't get a whole lot of attention, or at least historically, recently has not gotten a whole lot of attention, um, because they offer fixed lens, that is a, a non-interchangeable lens, um, a fixed lens, and um, they rely on zone focusing, which uh, was kind of a turn off up until now, but I think today that offers a bit of an advantage because of its simplicity. Um, and I think this class of camera is worth, um, is worth looking at and, and thinking about. Uh, that doesn't, there's no real name for it, so I'm just calling them the Mini Panzers because they're compact German tanks, <laughs> essentially. Um, they, these are uh, compact cameras of the 1950s and 1960s. Essentially, these were the, um, uh, the point-and-shoots of the, of the 50s and 60s. Uh, they weren't called point-and-shoots back then, but that's, that's basically the role they fulfilled. Um, they are all made in West Germany, uh, and they have certain common features, uh, one of which is a mostly metal construction, very high quality, uh, good solid construction, which qualifies them as uh, built like a tank as far as I'm concerned, certainly compared to the point and shoots of the 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s. Um, it's just no comparison whatsoever. Uh, they're very well built, uh, well engineered cameras. So yeah, little German tanks, mini panzers. Um, and I think they deserve some uh, consideration nowadays as the price of film cameras is going up simply because, you know, there's, uh, this, well, the supply is finite uh, and um, they ain't making no more of these. Well, yeah, they kind of are. I mean, you can buy a brand new point and shoot sort of, but they're basically glorified disposable cameras that you can change the film. Um, and they, the, you know, I mean, they offer a single shutter speed. Um, fixed aperture, fixed focus, it's, it, I mean, you, you really can't compare in terms of features um, those things with uh, either the point and shoots of the 1990s or with these cameras here. Uh, these cameras offer much more um, uh, opportunities for creative control than, um, than the, the little plastic um, um, semi-disposable cameras you can buy nowadays, uh, new. Um, well, what are the advantages of these things? What are, their, what are their features? Well, like I said, they were made in West Germany. They're mostly metal. They were made in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, most of these models were produced up until the mid-60s. By the late 60s, they were, they were pretty much gone. Um, and they were very well made, and many of them survive today because these were consumer cameras. Some of them were given as gifts and um, used once or twice and put in a closet and forgotten about. And uh, you can still find them today in relatively good condition. Some of them were made with light meters. If they did come with a light meter, it was a selenium type, the old-fashioned selenium light meter. Uh, the advantage is that it doesn't require a battery. The disadvantage is it's not very sensitive and low light, and they do wear out over time. And um, um, so if you, if you get one with a working light meter, that's, that's kind of a bonus. Uh, essentially, when shopping for these, you, sh you should assume that, do not assume that the light meter is gonna work. Uh, treated as a, a as a meterless camera, and if you got one uh, with a with a working meter, that's just that's a bonus. Um, another advantage of these things is that they can be fixed, and I'll give you an example um, of this camera right here. So this is a Zeiss Contina. Um, it says Contina right there, and when I bought it, it was advertised as needing work. I wasn't sure exactly how much work it needed, so I tried to shoot a test roll, uh, and the thing just, uh, it, it ripped up the test roll, uh, wasted the roll film. So I took it to the legendary Yaakov on Allenby Street in Tel Aviv, and uh, for under $100, he took it apart, cleaned it, put it back together, handed it to me and says, here you go, it's gonna work just fine. And indeed it does, and it works beautifully. You can't do that with the point and shoots from the 1990s. You're not going to take one of those to a tech and have them take it apart and clean it and put it back together good as new. Those cameras relied upon electronics um, and the electronic of that era of that, you know. So when you buy a, you know, a point and shoot from the 1990s, you're buying consumer electronics from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, um, you know, when, it, when they break, they're gone. They're done. That's it. Um, they're, they're, I, I don't think it's, it's a realistic option to, uh, to think that you can fix those things. Whereas these um, do have some, uh, they do have some collector interest and um, they can be fixed. There are still people around who know how to fix them. Um, in fact, if, you're, if, if you uh, have some uh, mechanical ability yourself, um, I don't, but if you do, uh, check out the YouTube channel of Chris Sherlock. He is a camera technician, I believe in New Zealand 
and uh, he does a YouTube series um, featuring a number of these cameras, particularly the Kodak series, the Kodak Retina and Retinet. Um, that's kind of his specialty. Um, but uh, he, he has instructional videos about how to take these things apart and clean them up and put them back together. So here's a couple of common features um, of these cameras. Most of them uh, use either the Prontor or Compor shutter. So the, this one says Prontor SVS. The SVS is, a, is one of the, uh, the, 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 one of the, the brands or uh, one of the series of the Prontor shutter. Prontor was made by was it a company, was Gautier, I think you pronounce it. Anyway, it was made by a third-party manufacturer, and it's very common. A lot of these cameras of this type use the Prontor shutter, such as this Zeiss Cantina. Here is a Kodak Retinet, which has a Prontor 500LK. Um, and here is a Voigtlander Vito CL, which features a Pronto LK, and a, a variation on the Prontor um, you know, from the same company. Um, the shutter speed, well, hold on a second, get one more. Here is a, a Voigtlander Vito 2, which offers a Compor shutter. Let me see if I can turn this around so you can see. Here we go. Compor was another uh, third party shutter manufactured by Deckel, I think was the name of the company, um, and was used by quite a few manufacturers, very popular. Uh, these are leaf shutter cameras, uh, and um, uh, they're very simple, very reliable, and uh, they can be cleaned up and fixed. So this particular, uh, well, when shopping for these cameras, the variations are the shutter speed range, um, the type of lens, the, the, num the number of elements in the lens, and um, the focal length. So most of the, well, this one, for example, has a high shutter speed of 500, and it goes down to one second. So that's a very nice range um, of shutter speeds on this camera. Um, other, um, uh, other um, models of the Vito 2 used an early version of the Prontor shutter, which had a more restricted shutter speed range. So when shopping for these cameras, do pay attention to your shutter speed range. Um, this camera features a shutter speed range of, take a look, uh, 1 500th to 1 15th of a second. So it does not go down to a full second. Slowest speed is 1 15th, high speed is 500th. Um, on the Kodak Retinet. We likewise have a high shutter speed of 1 500th and the slowest shutter speed of 1 15th. Okay, um, and let's see here. This is the Zeiss Cantina. Offers a high shutter speed of 1 300th and a slow shutter speed of 1 second. So the shutter speed range varies. Um, some of them are missing the, the lowest shutter speeds. Um, for example, two of those cameras over there only go down to 1 15th. Um, uh, some of these uh, offered a high shutter speed of, uh, some cameras in this class even offered a high shutter speed of 1 200th. Um, the highest shutter speed in this class of camera is 1 500th. So that's something to be aware of. The other thing to be aware of is the lens. So this lens, uh, and these cameras generally come with either a 45 millimeter or 50 millimeter lens. If it's a 45 millimeter lens, it's almost certainly a three element triplet design, such as this uh, Novar Anastigmat from uh, Zeiss, uh, although it is good quality. This is a nice sharp little lens for three elements. Um, this Kodak Retinet has a Rodenstock Riamar 4528, again, 45 mil, uh, millimeter focal length, um, and it is indeed a three element lens. Um, and this lens offers, oh, a bit of character, shall we say. Um, it gives the pictures a nice, uh, well, a, a vintage look, if that's what you're going for, um, to put it euphemistically. Um, the, this Voigtlander offers a color scope bar. The color scope bar was a Zeiss Tessar copy in terms of its optical formula. This one goes, uh, is a 50 millimeter lens with a maximum aperture of f2.8. This particular lens is a little soft around the edges, but um, uh, sharp in the center. Whereas this Voigtlander, an older model, with a color scope R lens uh, with a maximum aperture of f3.5, this thing is tacked sharp corner to corner. It's really impressive. Um, of all my uh, mini Panzers, this is easily the sharpest lens that I that, uh, in, in my collection. Um, so that's a variable to, to consider. You also notice that on this camera, it is a folding uh, camera. 
Most of the cameras in this class were not. Um, uh, this is kind of a, a bit of a novelty, um, but I like it. It's fun, and um, you know, it's just, it, it looks a bit, I mean, it looks pretty darn cool, uh, and it's fun to use. So um, here you see the um, the selenium light meter. When you see this this sort of um, feature on the front, it's almost certainly selenium light meter. Likewise, here on the retinet, selenium light meter there. Also on the Zeiss Cantina, this one has the light meters up under this cover here. Um, fortunately, on all three of these cameras, the light meter works and it's accurate. So I lucked out. I really lucked out. The uh, this particular. Um, Voigtlander does not, well, it, it was not made with a light meter, it doesn't come with a light meter. Um, so these cameras, I predict, will probably remain inexpensive, and I think they're going to remain inexpensive simply because um, the, it requires a learning curve. If you're not familiar with film photography, there, there's a certain set of skills you need in order to use these cameras. You need to understand the exposure triangle. You need to understand how to meter light manually, uh, either with a light meter app on your phone or with a handheld light meter in case the built-in light meter doesn't work or in case it, it was not built with a light meter. Um, uh, you also need to know how to load film. Uh, and that's, a, that's something that cannot be taken for, taken for granted nowadays. I mean, a, a lot of people like the um, 1990s era point and shoots because they offer um, automated motorized film loading. Um, in fact, the, uh, you know, I, uh, I think Ilford or Harmon offers a, um, um, uh, a brand new point and shoot with, again with a, with a single um, uh, shutter speed and a, a fixed aperture, but with motorized film advance. So, you know, that's, that's telling you what, what does the market want. The market, it wants a camera that's easy to load because people don't understand how to load film anymore. Um, so it, you know, that's a required skill. So you need to know that. You got to know how to zone focus. Um, and you've got to understand exposure. So I've done a, um, I've done a video on how to, um, uh, on zone focusing, how to do that. Um, it's not, conceptually it's not that hard once you, once you understand it. And um, I've done um, uh, uh, film loading videos for every single one of these cameras, plus a bunch of others. I've got a playlist simply called Loading Film, uh, where I load film into uh, you know, pretty much every camera in my collection. Um, but these cameras are worth considering. They're worth taking a look at, uh, and they're worth investing in, uh, because, you know, the, the, well, again, I'm tempted to say they're not making any more, but, you know, look at what they are making. Cheap, plastic, single um, uh, shutter speed, fixed focus, fixed aperture. Uh, whereas these cameras offer uh, classic optical designs um, with lots of character. They offer a wide range of shutter speeds and, um, uh, and uh, uh, apertures as well. So give it some thought. I mean, I, I think, I think this, this class of camera, their time has come. I believe that, the, uh, uh, that these cameras should be, uh, you know, should be given a little bit more serious consideration. Um, I mean, most people don't even know about them. But um, they're out there. They're not that hard to find. And they're really inexpensive. And uh, because of the amount of knowledge required to use them, I think they're going to stay cheap. Um, and that is a bonus for anyone who is willing to invest the time to learn how to use these things. Um, it's, it's really not that much of a learning curve. I, I just, you know, and, and if, you want to, uh, if you want to have a camera that's reliable and that you know that you can use for years and years into the future, instead of something that's you know, plastic and is almost certainly going to break um, sooner rather than later, well, these are worth looking at. These are absolutely worth looking at. So check out the individual videos I've done for each one of these cameras. Um, and uh, usually I've got a, a review video and a loading film video for every single one of them. Um, and uh, look at some of the other um, options in this class. The, uh, um, in addition to these specific cameras, um, the, uh, I think AGFA made a line of cameras called the Silet, S-I-L-E-T-T-E. -E. Um, there, there may be some other um, uh, manufacturers that made cameras very similar to this, which would fit in this class. Um, I believe Pentacon in East Germany made something similar under the Wera, W-E-R-R-A, or Vera, I, I suppose, uh, brand name. Uh, I don't know much about it, but um, I've, I've heard of it, never seen one, never, never used one. 
Um, but this is a classic camera that's worth considering and um, give some thought. All right, that's about all I've got to say. That's, that's my message for the day. Hope you found it useful or informative. And if so, please do like and subscribe. And as always, check out the links down below. Thank you now. Bye-bye.